Hello and welcome to Monday Math with Martin. It's Monday, I'm Martin, and this is Math. In today's show, we're talking about polynomials. Like this one, 2x squared plus 3x minus 5. Now, if I ask you to find the roots of this polynomial, I trust that you will know what to do. You will probably recall the quadratic formula, and you will know that all you need to do to find the roots is plug in the coefficients into the formula. Really, the quadratic formula is quite a lovely thing. And perhaps it makes you wonder, how do you come up with a formula like that? And better yet, is there a way to extend it to polynomials of higher degrees? Now, at the time young Evariste Galois was walking the face of the earth, general formulas for the roots of polynomials of degree 3 and 4 had already been discovered, but there was some suspicion that no such formula could exist for polynomials of degree 5. Now let me ask you this, if you wanted to prove or disprove the existence of a formula for the roots of polynomials of degree 5, where would you begin? That's the central question we're going to address in this video. Now I want to be clear, we will not be disproving the existence of the notorious degree 5 formula. That's the big famous result that's attached to Galois theory and that's beyond the scope of what we're going to be doing. Rather, I want to show you a different theorem, one that I think you should see before you go on to study Galois theory. It's called the Fundamental Theorem on Symmetric Polynomials, and apart from being just a pleasant piece of maths in its own right, I think that it functions as a sort of gateway into Galois theory, in that it introduces some of the key ideas that are then developed and elaborated on in Galois theory. So my hope is that by talking about this theorem, we will gain a better understanding of how Galois theory came to be, which might make the subject feel a little more approachable. Let's jump right in. Consider the polynomial x cubed plus 2x squared plus 3x minus 5. Now I've picked these numbers just so we have something concrete to work with. However, the journey that I want to take you on will not depend on this specific polynomial. In fact, the ideas and the arguments that we will be exploring throughout this video will work just as well for any single variable polynomial of your choice, provided it has rational number coefficients. So anyway, what can you tell me about the roots of this polynomial? Perhaps the fundamental theorem of algebra comes to mind, which states that this polynomial has exactly three roots over the complex numbers. Let's call them alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3. Now, knowing this, we can write out our polynomial as a product of linear factors. So we have x minus alpha 1 times x minus alpha 2 times x minus alpha 3. And when we expand this out, we get an expression in which the coefficients of our polynomial are now expressed in terms of its roots. To make this correspondence more explicit, let's write it out as a system of equations and let's move the minus signs to the other side because that's a little bit more pleasant. So these relations are quite special and I want to take a moment to appreciate what they mean to us. They are special because they capture the relationship between the coefficients of our polynomial, which are known, and the roots of our polynomial, which we want to learn more about. So it's sensible that any investigation into the roots of our polynomial might start right here. And that's kind of the theme of this video. We're going to ask how much information can we derive from these relations alone. But we're going to frame this slightly differently. We're going to use a narrative device. So let's isolate these expressions on the left hand side. Let's draw a little bag around them. Let's label it known because we know the values of these expressions. It's quite natural to think of this bag as a subset of the space of all possible expressions in the roots. And so the question we're wrestling with is what else is in the bag? Which other expressions in the roots might become known to us? Pause that thought. We will return here in just a moment. But before we go any further, we should introduce a couple of definitions that will give us the right language to talk about the ideas that are to come. 
first definition, polynomial. Now, chances are, since you're still watching this, that you're already familiar with the notion of a polynomial. But I will be absolutely flooding you with the term until the rest of the video, so it will pay off to be rigorous about it. Basically, a polynomial expression is any expression that you can build out of variables and constants using only addition and multiplication. Variables are just symbols, and constants are typically numbers, sometimes more abstract things. So this is the basic definition, but I want to point out some nuances that will come up. So in this video, you will both see expressions like alpha 1 plus alpha 2 plus alpha 3, as we saw in the example just a moment ago. And at other times, you might see polynomials like x plus y plus z. And on the surface, those two things might look rather similar. Both are just expressions built out of symbols and possibly numbers. This makes it all the more important to stress that they are not the same thing. So in the first case, alpha 1, alpha 2 and alpha 3 stand for complex numbers whose value we don't know. While in the second case, x, y and z are not numbers, they are variables. And the difference between the two cases manifests itself when we think about what equality means in each case. So for instance, we might derive that alpha 1 plus alpha 2 plus alpha 3 equals minus 2, which is just to say that three complex numbers sum to minus 2, which is not so strange to believe. However, if we were to claim that x plus y plus z equals minus 2, that's more difficult to justify, because that would imply that any numbers that we substitute into x, y, and z would have to satisfy this relation, and that's just obviously not true. Another way to put this is that equality of polynomials is more rigid. Any equality of polynomials we wish to derive has to follow directly from the laws of algebra. To give a trivial example, the polynomial x times y plus z equals the polynomial x, y plus x, z. That's just the distributive property, and it's universally true. So the point here is that any insight that we might derive about polynomials, any equality of polynomials, is universal in the sense that we can substitute any numbers into such an equality, and it will still hold true. Second definition, symmetric polynomial. Now this one's in the title, so you know it must be important. And we call a polynomial symmetric if its value doesn't change when you permute its variables. This is best understood by example. The polynomial x squared plus y squared plus z squared is symmetric in x, y, and z because no matter what permutation you apply to the variables, its value doesn't change. For example, I might swap x and y, and this doesn't change the value. To give a non-example, the polynomial x minus y is not symmetric in the variables x and y, because when you swap the variables x and y, you get the polynomial y minus x, and y minus x is not equal to x minus y in general. We will be seeing examples of y symmetry such as special property in just a little bit. Last one, elementary symmetric polynomials. Now you've already seen something related to elementary symmetric polynomials in this video, it will become clear what I mean once I spell out the definition. The elementary symmetric polynomials in n variables is a special collection of polynomials whereby the first elementary symmetric polynomial is defined as the sum of all variables. The second elementary symmetric polynomial is defined as the sum of all products of pairs of variables. The third elementary symmetric polynomial is defined as the sum of all products of triplets of variables. And all the way up until the nth elementary symmetric polynomial, which just consists of one term, namely the product of all variables. So why should you care about the elementary symmetric polynomials? Well, the elementary symmetric polynomials encode the pattern by which the roots of an arbitrary polynomial are related to its coefficients. So recall our bag of known expressions in the roots of our polynomial. And you'll notice these are simply the elementary symmetric polynomials in three variables where we have substituted the roots alpha 1, alpha 2 and alpha 3 into the variables x, y and z. 
Okay, enough definitions for now. Let's return to our bag of known expressions. I'm going to add an expression to the bag. I want to claim that the value of the expression alpha 1 cubed plus alpha 2 cubed plus alpha 3 cubed is exactly 25. Now, you're right to be suspicious at me just throwing random numbers at you, so I'm going to share how you could derive this yourself. In fact, we're going to show something much stronger. We're going to show that you can compute the value of any expression that is the sum of powers of our roots. So to be precise, we're going to show that you can compute the value of any expression of the form alpha 1 to the power of k, plus alpha 2 to the power of k, plus alpha 3 to the power of k. This insight stems from a theorem that is typically accredited to Newton. On the surface, the theorem doesn't directly address expression involving roots in the way that we have been doing. Instead, it presents a general principle for polynomials in n variables. Specifically, it asserts that any sum of powers of these n variables can be expressed using elementary symmetric polynomials. So for instance, the polynomial x cubed plus y cubed plus z cubed can be expressed as the first elementary symmetric polynomial cubed minus three times the first times the second elementary symmetric polynomial plus three times the third elementary symmetric polynomial. We're going to abbreviate these as E1, E2, and E3, respectively. We can make use of this theorem in our investigation by substituting the roots alpha1, alpha2, and alpha3 into the formal variables x, y, and z. Now remember, substituting the roots into the elementary symmetric polynomials gives us values that we know, which enables us to resolve the value of the entire expression. All right. Let's see why Newton's theorem holds. We're going to stick with polynomials and free variables x, y, and z because it looks more pleasant on screen, although the argument would work just as well for polynomials with arbitrary many variables. We're going to start by constructing a little table. Across the first row, we arrange the elementary symmetric polynomials and free variables. Down the first column, we enumerate the sums of powers of three variables in ascending order. We imagine that the table is navigated along two distinct dimensions. The first dimension, from top to bottom, corresponds to the value of the exponent of the first variable in each term of the expression. The second dimension, from left to right, corresponds to the length of individual terms in the expression. With this in mind, let's try filling in some of the remaining table entries. For example, let's focus on the slot in the third row and second column of the table. The expression that lives here is the sum of all possible terms made up of two variables, with the first variable raised to the power of 3. Following the same pattern, let's now fill in the other terms as well. Our mission is to show that any entry in the first column, the power sum polynomials, can be expressed using entries in the first row, the elementary symmetric polynomials. Perhaps you're curious why we've bothered to populate the table with all of these other, seemingly unrelated, entries. The reason is that these auxiliary expressions will help us with our proof. Instead of proving the statement directly, we will derive a simple fact about the table. Namely, we will show that any table entry in any row can be expressed algebraically using entries in the rows above it. Let me show you why this is enough to complete our proof. For instance, take the power sum polynomial in the fifth row. According to the proposition we're about to prove, it can be expressed algebraically using entries in the first four rows. Similarly, any entry in the first four rows can be expressed using entries in the first three rows. Any entry in the first three rows can be expressed using only the first two rows. And any entry in the second row can be expressed using entries in the first row. To summarize, the power sum polynomial in the fifth row can be expressed using only entries in the first row.
the elementary symmetric polynomials. It gets quite messy, but you see the point. By the same logic, any power sum polynomial can be expressed using elementary symmetric polynomials. All right, let me show you why any entry can be expressed using entries in the rows above it. Start by picking any row other than the first row, let's call it i, and any column other than the last column, let's call that j. The product of the i-th power sum polynomial, that's the table entry with coordinates i, 1, and the j-th elementary symmetric polynomial, that's the entry with coordinates 1, j, equals the sum of the table entries with coordinates i plus 1, j, and i, j plus 1. Why? When we expand out this product, we see it as a sum of all possible products of a single variable raised to the power of i times a term that contains j distinct variables. When taking such a product, one of two things can happen. If the variable raised to the power of i appears in the term of length j, then their product remains of length j, but the exponent of the distinguished variable is incremented. If the variable raised to the power of i does not appear in the term of length j, then the length of their product is incremented, but the exponent of the distinguished variable stays as is. In this way, we obtain all terms that appear in the entry i plus 1 j, as well as all terms in the entry i j plus 1. And all that's left is to regroup the terms so that the sum becomes obvious. Now rearranging this identity and then shifting variables shows that any table entry i j can indeed be expressed using entries in the rows above. Some minor adjustments are necessary in the corner cases, when i is one of the first two rows, or j is the last column. But these are technical, and there's nothing illuminating about them, so I'm not going to go into the details here. If you're curious, I'd like to invite you to think through these cases on your own. Anyway, having shown that any entry can be expressed using entries in the rows above it, this completes the proof of Newton's theorem. Now let's return to our bag of known values. We have seen that from the coefficients of an arbitrary polynomial alone, we are able to compute the value of any sums of powers of its roots. Now the computation suggested by our algorithm is quite awful as it involves possibly working through a table of very many entries, but all that matters to us right now is that it can be done by a mechanical procedure. Now already this is a neat result, but it would be a shame if we stopped here because we're about to get very lucky. Turns out that building on the result about power sums, we are able to show that our bag of known values actually contains a much larger class of expressions, contains all symmetric expressions in the roots. In other words, all symmetric expressions in the roots of a polynomial are known values. For instance, this expression works out to be exactly minus 21. Let me show you how to derive that. This result follows from what is known as the fundamental theorem on symmetric polynomials. As before, this is formally a general principle that applies to polynomials, but we can make it work for our purposes by substituting roots into the variables. We're going to prove the following statement. Any symmetric polynomial can be expressed in terms of power sums. Since we've already shown that power sums can be expressed using elementary symmetric polynomials, this amounts to saying that any symmetric polynomial can be expressed using only elementary symmetric polynomials. So let me give you an example. The symmetric polynomial x squared times y plus z plus y squared times x plus z plus z squared times x plus y can be expressed as the first power sum polynomial in the variables x, y, and z times the second power sum polynomial minus the third power sum polynomial which we might abbreviate as S1, S2, and S3, respectively. Let's now substitute our roots alpha1, alpha2, and alpha3 into the variables x, y, and z. Using our previous result, we can compute the value of the power sums in the roots, which ultimately means we can compute the value of the expression. 
All right, so let's prove why this works for any symmetric polynomial. Before we begin our proof, there's just one little remark I want to make. Now, since this is the fundamental theorem on symmetric polynomials, you will not be surprised to hear that the proof we will give will rely on the symmetry of the polynomials that we're working with. Now, to make this dependence on symmetry stand out, we will use a little narrative device. We will think of symmetry as a sort of joker cart, one that enables us to make progress when otherwise we wouldn't be able to. Okay, let's get to it. We will prove the statement by induction on the number of variables. That means we're splitting the proof into two parts. First, we're showing that the statement is true for all single variable polynomials. Then, we're showing that if the statement is true for all polynomials with n minus 1 variables, then it is also true for all polynomials in n variables. The idea being that knowing that the statement is true for all single variable polynomials implies that it is true for all polynomials in two variables, which implies that it is true for all polynomials in three variables, and so on and so forth. So using these two parts of the proof, we conclude that the statement is true for polynomials with any number of variables. That's the idea. Okay, in the first part, we need to prove that any symmetric polynomial in a single variable x can be expressed using power sums of that variable. Now, this statement proves itself when we unpack what it actually means. Power sums in a single variable are simply the powers of that variable, and any polynomial in a single variable is by definition already expressed using powers of that single variable. That was easy, so let's move on to the second part of our proof, the inductive step. Supposing the statement is true for polynomials in n minus 1 variables, we need to show that it is also true for polynomials in n variables. Thus, starting with any symmetric polynomial f x1 through xn, we must show that it can be expressed using power sums of the variables x1 through xn, and we will describe an algorithm that does this. To keep things pleasant, we will apply the algorithm to a concrete example polynomial. But, as we have done before, the same procedure works in a general case just as well. The example polynomial we will be working with is the one we saw just a moment ago. x squared times y plus z plus y squared times x plus z plus z squared times x plus y. We start our procedure by randomly choosing one of the variables x, y, and z. Um, I choose x and rearranging our polynomial as a polynomial in x with coefficients that themselves are polynomials in y and z. We can do this by expanding the polynomial out fully, grouping the terms by the power of x they contain, and using the distributive property. It is apparent from this example that the coefficient polynomials are symmetric in y and z. However, we promised that our procedure would work in the general case. And in the general case, we would need to justify why this is true. To justify why these coefficient polynomials always end up symmetric in y and z, we will use the symmetry card. Now suppose we permute the variables y and z in f. Since f is symmetric, its value doesn't change by this transformation. And thinking of f as a polynomial in x means that equality implies that the coefficients behind the powers of x must match. Thus the value of the coefficients is equal after permuting the variables y and z in f. Now realizing that the coefficient polynomials are symmetric in y and z unlocks our induction hypothesis. We're allowed to assume that the statement holds for polynomials in two variables, thus the coefficient polynomials may be expressed using sums of powers of y and z. We don't technically need this for a formal proof, but here we've computed these expressions, where s1 prime and s2 prime denote the power sums y plus z and y squared plus z squared respectively. It feels like we've moved a little bit closer to our goal because power sums have appeared in our expression. However, Whilst s1 prime and s2 prime are indeed power sums, they don't quite get the job done 
because there are not power sums and free variables, which is what we need. To incorporate x, we note the following straightforward identity. Namely, the kth power sum in the variables y and z equals the kth power sum in the variables x, y, and z minus x to the power of k. Using abbreviations, we write s1 prime equals s1 minus x and s2 prime equals s2 minus x squared, which enables us to replace the power sums in y and z in our expression with power sums in x, y, and z. After this initial transformation, we are left with a polynomial in x with coefficients that are polynomials in the power sums s1 and s2. It feels like we're close to our goal because the correct power sums have now appeared in our expression, but we're not quite there since we still have those instances of x all over the place. But how do we get rid of those instances of x? It doesn't really feel like there's any moves to be made here. The key insight is that this is still a symmetric polynomial in x, y, and z. Even though we have abbreviated some terms as s1 and s2, these are still made out of our original variables. So we can use the symmetry card again. For example, we might apply the permutation to it that swaps x and y and see what happens. Let's apply this permutation to each part of the expression. Since the power sums s1 and s2 are symmetric polynomials, they don't change. Thus the coefficient polynomials remain equal. We end up with a polynomial that looks virtually identical to the one we started out with, the only difference being that the instances of x have been replaced with y. In the same way, swapping x and z gives us the same polynomial in z. Ultimately, using the symmetry card gives us a system of equations, where we have rewritten our original polynomial in three different ways, as a polynomial in x with power sum coefficients, a polynomial in y with power sum coefficients, and a polynomial in z with power sum coefficients. Now here comes the most satisfying part of the proof. We take the sum of the equations. On the left hand side, this amounts to just three times our original polynomial. The magic happens on the right hand side. Let's take the sum term by term. We notice that using the distributive property when grouping terms, we end up with an expression that consists entirely of power sums. Now all that's left to do is divide by 3 and simplify, and we're done. We've re-expressed our polynomial in terms of power sums. Let's return once again to our bag of known expressions. It's beginning to look quite full. We have seen that we can compute the value of any symmetric expression in the roots alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3. And this alone is a pretty remarkable insight, and it lends itself to some quite useful applications. For example, we can use this fact when we derive the cubic formula. However, I would like to put applications aside for a moment and think about the big picture here. In my mind, our exploration has achieved two things. Given a polynomial with roots alpha 1 through alpha n, we have started to think about the vast space of expressions in those roots. Then, with the help of the fundamental theorem on symmetric polynomials, we have recognized that the subset of symmetric expressions is special because we know how to compute the value of symmetric expressions. So two things. We consider the space of all possible expressions in the roots, symmetric or otherwise, and we elevate the importance of symmetric expressions. I believe this sets us up perfectly to study Galois theory. Let me explain. The space of expressions in the roots is the arena in which Galois theory plays out. There, it is referred to as the splitting field of a polynomial f of x. And the special importance attributed to symmetry strikes gold. It turns out that symmetry serves as the organizing principle in uncovering the structure of the space of expressions in the roots. However, in order for that structure to be able to crystallize, a necessary step towards Galois theory is to introduce nuance into the notion of symmetry. So far, we have considered the symmetry of polynomials as a binary concept. 
a polynomial is symmetric or it isn't. In Galois theory, we consider the symmetry of expressions in the roots themselves, and we develop the language to compare the symmetries of different expressions in the roots. So we might say that one expression is more symmetric than another expression, or one expression might be symmetric but in a different way. Now anyway, before this becomes too vague and mystical, I'm going to stop myself. So to wrap up, you can think of the fundamental theorem on symmetric polynomials as the first brushstroke of the masterpiece that Galois theory completes. And that's all from me. Thanks for watching. There's a few more things I'd like to say, and chief amongst them is I want to give credit to my main reference, which is a book called Galois Theory by Harold M. Edwards. And to give you a little backstory of how this video came to be, I study maths, and one of the things that I found frustrating when learning about Galois theory is that you're introduced to all of this language of Galois theory, language of modern mathematics with all of these abstractions that are already in place, all of these words like fixed fields and splitting fields and groups and what have you. It's kind of difficult to make sense of how these abstractions came to be, of how you would settle on exactly those definitions and not other ones. And I think the book that I'm referencing does a wonderful job of illuminating the path towards Galois theory. It sort of stays close to the historical development of the subject while still being math exposition and introduces the ideas in an order that made sense for me to follow. Um, and so you can think of this video as being loosely based on the first few chapters of this book while the actual content diverges quite heavily from the book the main proof ideas for example are taken from there um i, I think that's pretty much all um if you're still watching i respect the commitment uh i would appreciate a like or something if you want to spare one have a blessed day